together. And in this series, the big picture, <laughs> we started off way back at creation. Now, over the last four weeks, Patrick, what did you talk to him about? Death? Isn't that right? Death. And then the next week, James talked about pain. And then Patrick came back and talked about sacrifice. And then, uh, Brian, I think you talked about sin last week. So a lot of warm, fuzzy topics uh, during those four weeks. But this week, we get the great joy of diving in on something that is the most beautiful story in the Bible. It's the story of redemption. Would you say that word with me? Redemption. If you want to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, and also put maybe a, a book note in 1 John 2, 2. We're going to go there as well. And I've got a story I want to share with you later on today about the beauty of God's redemption and the specific work that Christ did for us that only he could do. But first, I want you to know that this story of redemption, look, I want to take you back for a minute. Some of you know, I grew up in a Baptist church, Alice Drive Baptist Church, small little church. I remember sitting on the pews at Alice Drive Baptist Church and hearing a, a song. Susan, you could come play it for us if I ask you to. Some of you probably know it. Redeemed, how I love to what? Proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. And I got to tell you, as a young Stephen, I remember sitting in there, that, that song stuck with me. I was into music back then. I played the trumpet and I remember thinking, man, that's got a great tune. It's got a great melody. And I, I would, I could even right now, I could hear it in my head. I can hear old Alice Tribe Baptist Church back then. I can still feel the feeling of everyone singing just like we just did this morning. But I've got to be honest with you. I have, I have to tell you that I had no idea what redemption really was. And many of you sitting here today are probably in that same category. And I want you to know that as I have prepared this sermon and journeyed through the scriptures getting ready for this, I have found a new depth to redemption that I did not even realize before. Redemption is the main point of the entire Bible. It is his story. So let me ask you a question. What do you think of when you hear the word redemption? This is not a word that we use a lot when we walk around in coffee shops or go out, you know, for a walk. We don't talk about redemption very much. If you do an internet search for redemption, a lot of things come up. But from a Christian standpoint, I want you to understand these statements. First of all, the, the redemption that we talk about today, it is an age-old story. It is an ancient and modern truth. It is something that every generation has longed for and celebrated. It's a primary core need of every person that has lived. It's a core issue. Redemption is a core issue that affects you before you even know that there's a problem. It's the type of thing that God talks about in the scripture when he says, when you were still yet sinners, Christ died for you. Redemption carries you into places that you cannot even imagine yet. The most exciting thing in our faith Today is over 2,000 years, and it's the story of Jesus Christ coming out of that grave and paving the way for us to have new life through faith in him. So what do you think of when you think of redemption? Is it an idea? Is it a concept? Is it something that connects with the, the heart that's beating inside of your chest right now? Do you understand how much God loves you that he would do this for you? Do you understand the power of our God that he could do this for you and for me and for everyone in this room and everyone who has lived throughout all of humanity? Redemption is a story that focuses around Christ. And you can't be a disciple of Christ. You can't, a disciple simply means follower. You can't be a follower of Christ if you don't understand what Christ has done for you. And in my notes right here, I, I could show it to you. There's a picture of a heart that I've drawn. Do you understand what God has done for you? Does it connect at a core level what he has done for you? When Christ died on the cross, when Christ paves the way for us to be redeemed, the beautiful thing is that that is a work that he has done, but it connects directly with who he is. See, with God, who he is and what he does is the exact same thing. It's not that way with us. We are redeemed. We're called to new life. We are new creations, but we still mess up. Not so with God. 
What he is and who he is and what he does are exactly the same thing. And so when Christ redeems us, he does something that connects with the core of who he is and the relationship that he wants to have with us. So let's talk about redemption for a minute. Here's a couple of thoughts on redemption. Redemption could be defined as the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. Another definition is the action of regaining or gaining possessions or something in exchange, here it is, for paying or clearing a debt. This is a big part of what we're talking about today. In fact, when you think about when Christ came on the scene 2,000 years ago and he started walking around and, and growing, it says that he grew in wisdom and favor and stature. And, and what happened to him when he went to the cross, when he died on the cross and he paid this price for us, he was clearing a debt, your debt and my debt. Simply put, from an Old Testament perspective, transitioning into the New Testament, this bigger picture, redemption means to save. It means to buy out. Now, for all of you business folks in the room, all you business folks, money people, I put myself in that category a little bit too, I want to talk to you about what I mean by buy out. See, that when we, when we think about buying something out today in a business setting, we might think of paying off something and receiving something that is monetary or physical, a business, a structure, an organization, something that can be held, touched, that's tangible. There's a debt that is associated with redemption as well, but it's not about revenue. The Bible is not talking about him paying something on your behalf. He is talking about redeeming you from being a slave to being a free person. The scripture tells us that when we're born into this world, we are born sinners and that we are captives to slaves and ca captives and slaves to sin itself. And when Christ redeems us, he sets us free. And true freedom means that we're just following him. Slaves into free people is the business of redemption. This is about humanity. Now, I got to tell you, 10-year-old Stephen sitting at Alice Drive Baptist Church, I didn't get any of that. Like, I was just like, that's a cute tune. I understand it. It's nice. Redemption, that's good. But as a person about to have a birthday tomorrow, and I won't tell you what age it is, every year I can tell you that the redemptive story of Christ touches at a different level. I have two daughters. What Christ has done for them touches at a different level. How many of you have grandchildren in this room? How many of you have your great grandchildren in this room? Yeah. What Christ does from generation to generation has a depth to it. He is saving the very humanity around us out of a fallen, enslaved state to evil and to sin. Now, I have done a lot of things in this life about that. But I have never redeemed anyone. In fact, like I said earlier, this is not a word that I really mess around with much. I don't know that it's a very common word. I think it's one of those words that I put it in the category of church table talk. Like we talk about redemption, we sing about redemption, but do we really understand what it is? Has it connected with you and me in a way that actually has application to how we build families and how we teach the Bible and how we love our neighbors? Do we understand that redemption is what ties all these things together that God has called us to do as disciples? He has bought us out of slavery and he has freed us to be not whoever we want to be, but he has freed us to be who we ought to be and who he has designed us to be in this world. That's why in Ephesians 2, Paul says that God has already prepared works for you to do. In this room, in this church, in this community, we have so much potential. And boy, does the world need the salt of the earth and the light of the world right now more than ever. Amen? We stand, church, at a pivotal point in, point in history where what we do will determine the outcome of the Christian kingdom movement moving forward. It's on us. This is our time. And remember, church, that we are saved. We are redeemed by grace alone. It's not by our works. It's through faith alone in Christ. It's not by church attendance or anything. It's Christ alone. And it is to the glory of God alone. This is not something that we get to brag about. It is God saving us. Only he could do it, and only he would do it. Jesus is the only king. No other king could or would do what redemption does for us. This is an ancient proclamation of the church. In fact, over the next year, starting sometime toward the end of the month, we're going to go through the book of Acts. I was going to show you guys this. 
But any of you want to get ahead of the game, we're going to go and journey through the book of Acts. And this is one of the resources that I use. The ESV Bible allows you to purchase what is called a, a Bible journal, I guess. And it basically has one book of the Bible that you can carry around with you, a little place to take some notes. And I've been using this already with our team as we've been preparing for this. By the way, didn't those guys do a good job preaching in July? Let's give them some encouragement. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, I was talking about team teaching a couple of years ago, and everybody's going, what's that? I don't get it. We don't do that in Southern Baptist culture, but we're seeing it here. And we have some great Bible teachers here at our church. Great, great men of God. So redemption, our topic today, is wrapped around Christ. Totally. There is no redemption without Christ. So as we talk about redemption, we need to start with Jesus, we need to stick with Jesus, and we need to end with Jesus. And that's not just for us today. The timeline, the big picture of all this, if you back up with me <laughs> to, to, the, to the creation, and then you see this, this relationship that's established with Abraham, James says that Abraham believed and God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And Abraham was given a, a promise that generations later, there would be another, a seed, a singular seed, Paul talks about in Galatians. There would be a seed that would come through his lineage that would save all humanity and make him the father of many nations. Now, the, the mistake that we make sometimes, I want you to hang on to this when we get to the application later, is Paul says 430 years, he talks about this in the New Testament, after Abraham, 430 years later, the law is established. And that law is put there to help us not make too many mistakes until Christ comes. But it was always about Christ. It centers and wraps around Christ for the big picture of all of his human history. There was a relationship tear that happened back in the garden with Adam and Eve, and God began to stitch it back together through Abraham. But understand that Abraham, the father of many nations, the patriarch, the, 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 this guy back here, it all points back to Christ when he comes 2,000 years ago and steps in on the scene. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3. Put your eyes on this. So then, the law was our what? Say it with me. Guardian until... Christ came. Redemption wraps around Christ. In order that we might be justified by faith in Christ. You have to understand this, folks. The law and all the legalism and all the commands and all the ought to's and ought not to's and all that, all that is just a band-aid. Paul's point here is that you will never work your way into a redeemed state. Only faith in Christ will accomplish that. So the law is our guardian. The law doesn't fix anything for us. It just tries to make sure we don't make anything worse for ourselves in the meantime until we get connected with Christ. We're all, through faith in Christ, sons and daughters of Christ. We are the offspring of Abraham, grafted in through faith in Christ. So the bottom line is that we don't, if we don't understand what redemption is, we can't really worship this God of this beautiful story. And this explains why we wind up worshiping all the wrong things all the time because we haven't engaged with the truth of who God is and what he's doing when he redeems us. Now, we're going to do a deep dive into redemption. Quick one, but a deep one. So buckle your seatbelts. There are two main words that you have to understand in order to really connect at a core level with the idea of redemption. Here's the first one, and it's the word propitiation. Christ is the propitiation for our sins. A simple way of saying that is payment. Now, this is a big girl, big boy word, propitiation. It's one of the reasons why we have the kids down in the kid zone, because this is a, this is a mouthful. John, the author of both the Gospel of John, Revelation, and, and then also the, the three epistles that he wrote, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, says a lot about this. He says that Christ is the propitiation for our sins, the payment for our sins, but not just for our sins as Christians, but for the sins of the entire world. Now, time out, that's a controversial statement. If John is saying what it sounds like he's saying, that means that everyone's sin has been paid for in all time, whether you're a Christian or not. All the payment for all the sins of the world, all of humanity has been paid for. But yet we're still sinful. We still make mistakes. And there's still an issue between us and God, but the issue is not our sin. The issue is our lack of belief. That's why in John chapter 3 it says, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Help me out. Eternal life. But whoever has not believed 
has, is, is condemned already because of his unbelief. So when Christ paid the price for our sin, when he did this propitiating work, the issue is no longer sin between us and God. It's all about faith. Now let me illustrate this for you. If any of us, God forbid, were to leave here, and I've said this before, it's a great illustration, and actually hit a kid on the way home and run over a child and kill them on the way home, that kid would die. And let's say that you were then charged with manslaughter and you were given a sentence. And you go to prison and you pay this sentence and you have paid your price. That's the propitiation. And you come out of prison. You have paid the judicial price for what happened. The problem is, is that there's still a dead kid. Do you see the difference? There's still a loss of life. So when we talk about redemption, we're not talking just about propitiation. We're talking about new life coming out of that. But the first step was Christ had to pay the price for our sins. This is a sin debt, a, a, a captivity that could only be released by him and was only released by him. There is no other name other than Jesus that saves. I don't care what you hear anywhere else. It's been tested. I'm convinced. I know who I believed in. And we see this in 1 John 2, our second passage. John says he is the propitiation for our sins, the payment for our sins, and not for our sins only, brothers, he says, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, the other word that we need to know is the word atonement. Because of the atoning work of Christ on the cross, sin is no longer the issue between us and God. Now, this is a matter of precision. This is a very precise word. It describes something very specific. Now, when we're talking about salvation, it's not okay to be vague. We need to be precise. And there's other things that we're pretty precise about. Like if you go have surgery, you want them to cut on the right thing, right? And nothing else. If you go get your car worked on, you want that car to be fixed the right way, not, not kind of the right way. You know, it's not enough just to say we're going to fix the thing. You know, you know the thing. No, it needs to be precise. We need to know what we're talking about, especially with something like this. When we're driving down the road, it's not enough to just kind of drive. You need to stay between the lines. It's not enough just to say you know the thing. We need to see the specifics of what it is. Jesus on the cross is an atoning work. But sometimes we like to hide in our vagueness, don't we? The reason for that is because it allows us wiggle room to do what we want to do instead of what we ought to do. But we need clarity here. Precision is something that we long for when we're in the surgery room. Without precision, a heart surgeon could nick the wrong thing and you could bleed out. If a, let me give you this. If a police officer pulled you over on the way home today, pulled you over and said, hey, I'm sorry, I have to give you a ticket. You said, what for? And they said, oh, you know the thing. <laughs> if you're like me, I'd be like, you have to tell me a little more than that. What thing? What was I doing? And then if I still don't agree with him, you know, I could go to court and argue it. You need an explanation. What Christ has done for us is something very precise. And here's four things I want you to know about redemption. Two of them are about us and two of them are about God. First thing is that redemption covers our greatest need. Whatever you think your greatest need is today, redemption is actually your greatest need. Let me make the case for it. First, because it combines healing from God with connection with God. So whatever we've walked into this list, whatever the items are on the top of our list today, our needs, maybe you're thinking about purchasing a new house or a car, or maybe you're, you want a, a spouse or you want to date somebody, or maybe you need more money, or maybe you need less money. I don't know what your situation is. Whatever that healing is, the real healing that we all are longing for, the emptiness that needs to be filled, can only be filled by God. And redemption fills that need. There is an eternal hole inside of all of us that can only be filled by an eternal God. And he's longing to fill us in. This is why we want to have this 21 days of prayer. Some of you may need to pray for those 21 days and take an attitude of mourning. It's been a lot of loss. You know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, sometimes they would mark off periods of time, even 40 days of mourning. There's been a lot of things that have happened. What is it that you need to heal from? 
Redemption provides the architecture and the soil for all of that to happen, for all that to be put back together. But it also connects us with God. It doesn't just heal us and leave us alone. Sin is what separates us from God, but this redemptive story is what brings us back together because sin can no longer have power over us, and he uses redemption to put us back together. I think this is why we need to be together as well. This whole midweek fuel thing, I'm going to rebrand it uh, when we crank back up later this month on Wednesday nights. We've got, we got some great plans for that. But uh, I think it needs to be midweek family fuel. We need to really think about coming together as a family of faith on a weekly basis and connecting together and with God. Second thing, it's not just about our need. This one's about God. Redemption is God's greatest gift. There is no better gift that God could give us, and there's two ways I want you to see this. It's his greatest gift, first of all, in quality. The quality of what he's done is amazing. There's a giant ship that um, couldn't go anywhere. It was stuck in the dock. The engine had broken. And they'd had numerous people come in and try to fix this ship so that it could get out of the dock and go out again. And they kept having people come in. They'd tinker around with it. Nothing happened. You know. So they, they didn't know quite what to do. They finally hired a guy who was a mechanical engineer and had retired with over 40 years of experience. I've been through all these other folks. This guy comes in, 40 years of experience. All these other guys spent days working on this thing, still couldn't fix it. He comes in. He inspects the engine very carefully. He looks at it a few times from top to bottom, just for a few moments. After seeing everything that he, that he uh, had looked at, he uh, called his assistant over and he said, uh, hand, me that, uh, hand me that small hammer in my bag. Grabs a hammer, picks the hammer up and puts it in his hand and he leans over to this one little spot on the engine and just taps it. <laughs> and soon after that, this huge engine starts cranking back up to life again. It was fixed. One little tap of a small little hammer. Weeks of other people coming in and out not being able to fix it. This guy walks in with 40 years of experience and taps it. Now, here's the interesting thing. The next week, about seven days later, the guy that owned the ship <laughs> gets a repair bill. And the repair, what do you think the cost of that repair was? $20,000. He charged him to fix that engine. The guy said, are you kidding me, $20,000? This guy did almost nothing. Have you ever had a plumber come? You know the feeling, right? You did almost nothing, and you give me this big bill. He said, I want an outline bill of how you're going to justify this $20,000. The guy said, that's no problem. I can give that to you right now. Just write it down here. Answer simple. First line item, tap with a hammer, $2. Second line item, know where to knock and how much to knock, $19,998. <laughs> this is the type of quality that Christ brings to our issues. There is no one else that can step into humanity the way he did. And in 33 years, broke into a perfect sacrifice for you and me and redeem us. But it's also the quantity, and I want you to soak this one up with me. 1 John 2, 2 says that it's all of humanity. All of humanity. This is for all of humanity. Why are we holding on to it? Why are we not sharing the gospel? Who's your one? Who is someone that's close to you and far from God? Who, who, who needs this great gift? It's around you right now. What are you waiting on? Redemption also reveals God's greatest reach. It reaches throughout all of history. That's why I wanted to talk about this in this series, The Big Picture. All the way back to the beginning, God knew what was going to happen. He was prepared. Through history, it has always been about redeeming from the very beginning to the end. That's why we have something that's even called pre-redemption that happens. Redemption has been in the forefront of time and creation, the fall of man, the Abrahamic covenant, with an individual, the coming of the law, the law being a piece of holding us in place until redemption did come, all the sacrificial systems that were put in place, the kinsman, redeemer of the Old Testament, the coming of Christ, the great redemption of Christ that fits around that beautiful passage, John 3, 16. But it also reaches throughout all of our nasty sin. Now, I want to ask you a question about this. What's the nastiest thing you've already done? Please don't answer out loud. 
Like that thing you don't want to talk about. You know, by the way, let me just interject there. There's a difference between being guilty. Guilt is different from shame. Guilt is when you did something wrong and you feel bad about it. Shame is when you are something wrong. He reaches through all of that, all of that sin. C.S. Lewis said that when God looks at us, he must be so offended, and yet he still loves us. Imagine if you had to save someone that was ugly, angry, stinky, dirty, loud, rambunctious, rebellious. You still had to do it. This reminds me when my girls were little. They're going to be embarrassed when I say this, but they'll have kids one day, you know, God willing. You know, let's put this picture of this baby on the screen. Look, that's a cute baby, right? You can't argue with that. But when babies are little, they have, little, they have nasty stuff that comes out of them, right? It's true. I've been told this. I don't personally like to change diapers. I did do some diaper changing, but my wife, I have to be honest, I didn't do a lot of it. But I did enough to know that it's nasty stuff that comes out of babies. But we clean these babies, don't we? We wipe their rear ends and we clean them up because we don't want them to sit in their nastiness. And it's the same way with God, the quality and the quantity of what he did. The fourth thing is that redemption solves our greatest problem. The first one is our greatest need, but this one is our greatest problem. And the problems are sin, what John talks about, and also death. Death is simply sim separation from God. And death is really the penalty for sin. That's where it comes from. So let's keep it simple. The old K-I-S-S, keep it simple, silly, right? Redemption is just a fancy way of saying that you're saved, that you have been set free, that you're no longer a slave to sin. So let me close with a couple of things that's in it for you. Here's some benefits of redemption. I'm going to back them up with some scripture. First, if you are redeemed, if you choose to place your faith in Jesus Christ, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see that you now have the gift of eternal life. Eternal life is a big deal. Eternal life is literally eternal. In Revelation 5, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every nation and every people. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That's still to come. He's done it. Eternal life. Second is forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 7 talks about this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We also have righteousness. Romans 5, 17 says, For if because of one man's trespasses, speaking of Adam, death has reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. We also have freedom from the law's curse. We're no longer slaves. Christ redeemed us, Galatians 3.13 says, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. This is a beautiful one. We have folks in our church that have adopted. I think adoption is one of the beautiful, most beautiful pictures of what redemption is. We have adoption into God's family. We don't belong there but we're adopted and grafted in. Galatians 4, 5 says, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might have received, we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. We also have deliverance from bondage. Deliverance is, is, is being freed and, and that whole idea of not being enslaved anymore. Titus 2, 14 says, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. First Peter chapter 1 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the passion of your former ignorance, but as he called you is holy, you also should be holy in all of your context, uh, conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishing things such as silver and gold. We also have peace with God. Peace. Colossians 1 says that, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Speaking of Christ, 
that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, he reconciled to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. And last, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and says, oh, do you not know? Church, hear this. Do you not know? That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. If you're redeemed, it means that you're forgiven, you're holy, you're justified, you're free, you're adopted, you're reconciled. The list goes on and on and on. The streets of heaven will be filled with former captives who, through no merit of their own, find themselves redeemed. What about you? Are you redeemed? Let me give you a couple of ways to think about this this week and apply it. First, I want you to connect back with me when I was talking about legalism. We really need to reject the mindset of legalism. It has no place in Christianity. Legalism is not Christianity. That's why we thrive and strive to be an environment of grace. Second is receive. Have you received the peace of God's redemption? Have you placed your faith in him? I'm going to give you a simple way to see that in just a moment. And if you have, I want to, in preparation for next Sunday, when I preach this sermon on the theology of rest, I want you to rest. How many of y'all just need to rest? I don't mean you don't work. It just means that you rest in his redeeming love and quit trying to work your way out of everything. Let him work it out for you. Would you pray with me? Father, I just pray right now a prayer of thanksgiving for what you've done in our church today in reminding us of this beautiful picture, this beautiful story of redemption, Lord. We thank you that in the beginning you created something that was beautiful, that had a perfect design. Lord, we thank you that even when we sinned as humans, you already had a plan through your son, Jesus Christ, that beautiful gospel message to redeem us because of his finished work on the cross, because he was a perfect sacrifice for us. He died. Father, we believe he died for us. We believe that he went into the grave, and we believe that he is alive today. Can I get an amen, church? We believe and we trust him. Father, I thank you that when we place our faith and we believe in him, Lord, you give us new life and new salvation. And Father, as we do that, we begin to see you restore the goodness of that original design in our lives, and we can pursue you in even a deeper way. Your mercy is more than any of us deserve, Father. Your mercy is more than any of us could earn or maintain. And Father, we thank you that because of your mercy, we can sing in freedom from sin. Lord, as we lift up this last song of worship today, we've gathered here to worship, Lord. I pray that our souls would be comforted as we sing. Lord, we know that your word calls us to sing. And Lord, these words that we're going to sing talk to us about and remind us about the mercy and the abundance of it. And Lord, I pray as we sing this, Lord, that we would be mindful of anything that your spirit may put on our hearts, that we would do what that scripture says, that we would walk worthy of the calling that we have. Thank you for redeeming us for saving us and for holding us in your hand and allowing no one, not even ourselves, to snatch us out. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said together.